That's why you need spirit and truth in order to connect. You got to acknowledge that, man, I don't even know how I got here. Worship you, when you truly enter into worship, you start to recognize, I don't know how in the world he allowed me to do this. One thing with praise, you can estimate, you can evaluate on God's greatness and you confer something on him because of your estimate what you estimate. You aspire, you saw him move, he does something wonderful and awesome and you praise him, you're blessing him from that place. Worship, man, in that God brings you in, he cloaks you under his glory, he cloaks you under his cover, brings you into place, and you get there and you weep and you're broken because you know that you're in a place you don't even deserve to be. That's how you get to do it. You gotta show some passion about this. You gotta show some drive about this. You gotta give us some hunger for this. You gotta have some passion, some hunger, some thirst for this. Just live like you're passionate. You gotta want this. So Father, I'm asking you every single one of us to this. Let's live green together, believe together right here. And I'm asking you and everyone we've been fighting about. Fighting, coming into what we need to be. Fighting, coming in to do what we need to do. Fighting, recognize the man in the future. Whatever the blocking us, keeping us, stopping us, keeping us from that place, I'm asking you to have agreement with me that would dare touch the same point with me. Those that are in this room, that's the word for the word, that's the definition for the word heaven, Shemaim. It means the place called fair. It's not ever moving. That's why he says in Psalms 119, 89, the word is forever See, in the heavens, we're not trying to figure out what needs to be done. And the issue is the enemy used all this movement, all this activity, all these crises, all these dilemmas, all these difficulties, all these happenings to get you and I on that movement of always moving because we're never going to arrive. We're never going to get to a place we're never going to be able to achieve. It's never going to happen. This is what's going to be a constant. And we get stuck in that place. No, no. Those things there, God is using the movement of the planet to reveal that he exists. The goal is, the movement is supposed to reveal, the crisis is supposed to reveal that God lives, God exists. That you can't live inside change. That's why God said, I'm shaking everything that can shake. Why am I shaking? Why am I shaking everything that can be shaken? So there are things that can't be shaken, that thing that can't change, that thing that can't move. But the enemy is using the disguise of all the things that are moving and shifting and changing and altering to say everything always moving and shifting and changing. You can't rely on God. God I thought God said, I thought God told me. He, he, he can't do nothing about this stuff. This stuff is still happening. Because if God could, if God was this, he would have. No, oh, you're too late. You're too late. All these things are being used. God is using the, the movable planet to reveal the immovable. You know, we say a lot of these things. There's a lot of uh, cliches. There's a lot of colloquialisms. There's a lot of things that we announce, things that we proclaim, a lot of proclivities. There's a lot of things that's being spoken, decreed, and declared, and things that we have, that we possess, that we picked up as colloquialism, the things that, that are sayings and, and buzzwords and catchwords and semantics and, and terminology and things that we use to express ourselves and to express where we're from, to express, express where we are. And much of that because it gets to be just kind of... Um, uh, it, it kind of be casual, just uh, cavalier. It's, it's not really a commi commitment and devotion. And uh, a lot of times we're we're not really locked in, not in the zone. And and as a result of it, we can tell that. And don't, no, you don't even have to guess about that. You don't even have to ask, you don't even have to take a survey. Because the old adage is, we're cleverly geared. Matthew 12 chapter. We was going to the Bible said you would know the tree. And fruit is supposed to affirm. The position of any root system if you want to know root system understand what people are coming from you want to know what people are about and and the bible clearly tells us it's not that which goes into the man that defiles him is what comes out of it so you and i we're not looking for how people what people are digesting we're looking for what they're expressing
you need spirit and truth in order to connect. You got to acknowledge that, man, I don't even know how I got here. Worship, you, when you truly get into worship, you start to recognize, I don't know how in the world he allowed me to do this. One thing with praise, you can estimate, you can evaluate on God's greatness, and you confer something on him because of your estimate, what you estimate. You were smart, you saw him move, he does something wonderful, awesome, and you praise him, you're blessing him from that place. Worship, man, in that God brings you in, he cloaks you under his glory, he cloaks you under his cover, brings you into place, and you get there and you weep and you're broken because you know that you're in a place you don't even deserve to be. That's how you get to do it. You got to show some passion about this. You got to show some drive about this. You got to demonstrate some hunger for this. You got to have some passion, some hunger, some thirst for this. Because you might be a passion. You got to want this. So if I'm going to ask you, you're going to ask you one of the things. Let's make green together, believe it together right here. And I'm asking you to get what we've been fighting about. Fight it, coming into what we need to be. Fight it, coming in to do what we need to do. Fight it, recognize the value of each other. Whatever the blocking us, keeping us, stopping us, keeping us from that place, I'm asking you to be in agreement with me that would dare to touch the same point with me. Don't let it be the name every knee has to bow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Every tongue will have to confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm really so thankful for what he is doing in his body. How he's causing his body to wake up out of sleep. In the name of the Lord Jesus, glory to God. Don't stop believing God. Don't stop believing him. Hallelujah, glory. For those loved ones that don't even look like that they know nothing about him. Hey, guess what? None of us did at one time. Hallelujah. We were all in that same position. Hallelujah. But the love and faithfulness of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad, God, that he does not leave us. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can y'all give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Can y'all, can y'all praise, can y'all give a praise like you own the winning team? Hey! 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 Hallelujah, Jesus! Yes! Woo! My God! My God! My God! Hallelujah! Out of the Apostle Grin said, the Lord told him, you praise me, I'll allow you to keep what, what I give you. You can keep it if you praise me. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. My God, he's so worthy. Yes, he is. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I bless him today. I honor him. Let me tell you something. He had his word written. He had his word written. You know what? To comfort us with. I'm so glad for the written word of God. I'm so glad that God confirmed his spoken word through the written word. Glory to God. He's still, he's still raising people from the dead. He's still raising from the dead. He said, I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. He said, I don't change. Hallelujah. I'm glad. I'm so glad. If you see it there, hallelujah, he's still doing it today. If you see it in his word, he's still doing it today. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And I say that I'm praying that God will remove blinders from his people's eyes. I'm serious. So we can see the work of God. It is going forth. And it's going forth mightily. It is going forth mightily. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me, let me say this real quick. My brother was, um, they, at St. Vincent's, he, they had let him come home. My God, too quick. He came home with a feeding tube, came home with a, with a catheter. Man, and they even assigned him a hospice nurse, letting the family know they think 
he transitioning. That's what they told him. Say, he's transitioning. No need to give medicine. The wife said, I do not receive that. That's what his wife said. You ain't got to believe everything a man say. I don't care what kind of degree they got. My God, have faith in him. Glory to God. And I want you to know, when they took him to UAB, they said, we're not going to take him to St. Vincent's anymore. We're taking him to UAB. When they did that, the, um, he was. He was man on his way out, praise God. But his, um, that, that ventilator, they had to put it, or the respirator had to put it all the way up just so we could breathe. Glory to God, hallelujah. He was on his way back, no responding. But I thank God after one day, after one day, it changed completely. Yes. Changed completely. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? Hallelujah. He said, when you pray my will, I hear you. Yes. That's what he said. Believe that. Okay. I thank God that the man of God is getting ready to come before us. I thank God so much for the powerful, awesome word of the living God and I encourage you stand on the word no matter what your eyes see no matter what your ears hear because in this hour we already know we have an enemy and he is going around like a roaring lion okay and do not take down do not take down of what God said he said, everybody that come to me must believe that I am and that I am a rewarder of those that diligently seek me, okay? But God also said this, judge yourself. Judge yourselves, amen? Judge yourselves. Glory to God. Let us make sure, hallelujah, we're pleasing him. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I will... Call Apostle Anthony Greer now, glory to God, and I just thank God for all of those that are in-house, hallelujah. I thank God for all of those that will be on social media, but we're going to call Pastor Glenda up, just for a second. Well, praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> We thank God. Hallelujah. How I many you know that obedience is better than sacrifice? Hallelujah. You know, a lot of times we try to give God a lot of different things when he's only asking for our obedience. Amen. I just thank God this morning because he is just so, so, so worthy. He's so good, sister. He is just too good, too good to be true. And I thank him for it. You know, when I woke up this morning, I was tired. Waking up tired is not good. And uh, my flesh was saying, you know what? You need a day off. You just need to stay at home and just stay in the bed. And I began, I turned on worship music and just began to meditate on the Lord. And my help came. My help came. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I started to receive the strength that I needed. How many know that God is a strengthener? All I had to do was just start meditating and thinking on his goodness, thinking about what he had already done, what he's going to do. And that strength came. It was like I couldn't get out of there fast enough. God is good. How many know that in his presence, there's fullness of joy? Everything that we need is in his presence. It ain't at the house. It ain't in the bed. It ain't having a pity party, but it's in his presence. So I thank God today that he'll, he'll meet us where we are. He'll meet us at that place. And not that only meet us, but he'll give us what we need. And I thank God for strength this morning. You know, last week I got prayed for, for strength. And I thank God for that. And I don't know who it was. It might have been Lady Greer that said it. I can't remember who said it. They said, sometimes you're sitting beside a person and you don't even know what that person is going through. It might have been useless. I, I'm not sure. But you don't really know. But God knows. 
God knows. And he is so good that he'll let somebody else know and they'll come and they'll come alongside and help. The Bible says, as you see that day approaching, that we are to exalt, exalt one another even the more. We're to go to one another's aid. Amen? I thank God for sending people to our aid and for helping us this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I tell you, I thank God. And, and we just praise God for this day. We thank God this morning for you that, that are joining us by social media. We thank God for those that are here, and we just believe that God has a word for his people today. Amen. Many got online, many came in this morning looking for God, expecting. And the Bible says that the God that we seek, he'll suddenly, suddenly appear. So can I just get everyone to stand on your feet as we receive the man of God this morning? We thank God for uh, Lady Deborah Greer that's just looking just so gorgeous this morning. We thank God for her, and we thank God for God's family today, for the family that's in the house this morning. Amen? So we're going to turn it over to Apostle Greer. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? <laughs> Anybody love him? Yes. Well, listen, let's give the Lord a shout because he's worthy. One more time. How many know this is the day the Lord has made? Man, we come to rejoice and to be glad. We're so thankful to God that we've been afforded this time. And even as a woman of God was giving her testimony, and that's what's been made available to us. That's what this hour is about. That's what these times are for. You know, we've been talking to people about understanding because if you don't know, if you don't, if you can't see the day, you can't what? You can't do the work. And see, the issue is we told you the devil needs darkness to work. The devil needs you not to know light's available. I said the devil needs you to not know light is available. He needs you to assess the situation, and it needs to be as dark, as gloomy, as glim. He needs you to see it like that. Because as long as you're seeing it like that, as long as you're looking at what you're looking at, guess what? You can't work. He done disarmed you. Uh, you're, 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 you are not a threat. You don't impose any challenge. You're not even in the game. Are you hearing me over here? The enemy needs you to see the dark. Because see, as long as you're looking at the dark, looking at the circumstances the way they are, as long as you're evaluating from your place of evaluation, you don't see. You don't see. And the old adage is this. You don't know you don't see. The same way you can't know when you don't know. You can't know when you know until you know. You don't know you don't know something until you know it. And people don't, listen, as believers, let's remember what Jesus said concerning this group who said they see. He said, when you say you see, he said, your sin remain. I came that you would be blind. I came that you, that you cannot see. Are you hearing me? Because you can't see, that you, can't, you won't be able to see until you know you can't see. You got to come to know you don't see to see. Most people are trying to see, and when they think they see, then they're thinking they're seeing, but you can't see by seeing. It's a revelation. Yeah. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm making a distinction between the worlds. Our world, I'm going to show you in a minute what I'm talking about. I need you to see these worlds. I need you to know there's a children. There are children on both fronts. You got children of disobedient claiming obedience. You got children who are disobedient claiming no, no God and be a part of God. Are you hearing me? Disobedient folk and claiming God. But the Bible said there is a children of disobedience. And the Bible says there's a motivating system that spawns them, that inspires them. Where they get motivation from? The Bible says they walk according to this course. There's a course that motivates disobedience. Disobedience is inspired. You don't just, listen, and it, to be a child of anything, that means somebody had to give birth to you in it. Am I right about it? To be a child of anything, you have to be birthed by somebody into it. It indicts that it doesn't originate with you. Darkness does not originate with you. Are you hearing me? And when I say you, I'm talking about people who don't know God or even people who don't know God's will in a matter or a circumstance or a situation. That's why God, the Bible says he lives in a life that's unapproachable by man. And that's why you can't discover God and he can't be found. He has to be revealed. And that's why people don't know they don't see. Are you hearing me? And that's why our walk as believers is so crucial and critical in this hour. Man, there's something in my spirit. It kind of reminds me. I'm going to give you kind of the, the script, the flip of the script. And to give you the reality of the script. I remember when there was a church I used to go to back in the day. 
after I had come out, we had come out from my home church, and I'm out by myself, and I don't know really what to do. Never been in this place before. When I got saved, I got saved in the organization. Part of my family, all of us was in the same place. But then when God called me out from there, he had to threaten me. That's the only way I'm going to leave. That was the only way I'm going to leave because I didn't know nowhere else to go. didn't know what to do. That's all I know. I came into Jesus through these people. Everything I know about you, they taught me. Now, where am I going? Yeah, but I need you to, it's time for you to, where I'm going? I, where, where I'm going to go? I don't know where to go. I have a clue where to go. And so he's got he's to get, get me ready. And part of this process and part of not knowing and, and, and the trepidations and all the emotions and the feelings of being in an unfamiliar place and not having the understanding and the comprehension and the insight and the mentorship and the fatherhood and the mothering and all the things you think you need to be in that place. All that was working for God. What y'all say? Y'all know I love talking about Gladys Knight. What you say? Listen, well, let me do this before I get going because I'm feeling myself pushing. And that's because I just left service. So I'm starting all over again. But we're going to do this right here. And so I want to welcome all of you that are live streaming this coming. And I don't know what social media outlet in which you guys are enjoying the service. But we do want to welcome you here. Thank God for every single one of you that are in the room. Thank God for praise and worship. And I bless God for all of you that were in your respective roles and your respective contributions. We honor you. Thank you. Thank God for you. Now, I'm going to get all of you to come go with me. We're going to go here. And right here, we're going to approach the throne or surrender before the heavens. And I believe that's Papa's up to something. I believe that's something in his heart, something on his mind that he wants to say, he wants to convey. And I want to be in the best possible position to make sure that you get that. I want you to be, I want him to be able to shine, come through. I want him to come up out from under, I want him to get out from under the bed I've been had him under. I want him to come out of the, under the bush, in the bush that I've been had him under. I want him to come out today. Everybody else coming out of the closet right here. I want him to come out of under the bush. I want him to come out to come out under the bed. What y'all say? Yes, I want him to find the platform, the stage, in which has been designed to re- expose and reveal light. What y'all say? So come go with me right quick at this place. Father, once again, we're thankful, grateful, privileged as we're acknowledging. And we're reverencing your throne, the awesomeness, the magnificence of your person. We're so grateful to God, thankful to God, privileged by God. For all that heaven has afforded us. And so as we're agreeing, believing, standing in faith, in the name of your son, I'm blessing heaven and believing God right here. And so as we're thankful to God, I'm joining faith with these, my brothers, my sisters, these men and women of God, the people of God, these that are gathered, those that are coming from the north, the east, the south, and the west, and whatever they had to come across to be here. We're just glad they won. And we're thankful, Father, as those that are live streaming, listening to us, I'm asking you to meet them at the point of their need. Those, Father, right now that are in that seat, in that place, they wait with bated breath on the hear Papa's voice. And, Father God, I'm asking you because I recognize them, but dust, I recognize my frailty. I surrender to the heavens, and I acknowledge Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need your leadership, your directions, your instructions. We're asking you to instruct us and lead us and guide us right here at this place. And so we honor you here. We're acknowledging you here. And we're lifting you up in the name of your son, in the awesome and the matchless name of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, we pray. Somebody give the Lord a shout because he's working. Now, Lord, unlock the Holy Writ. I need you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I need you to unlock the Holy Writ. Unlock these pages. Let this people down in the midst of your counsel. Reveal that which is in your heart. Show them. Disclose unto them. Holy Spirit, we trust you. You're our leader. You're our teacher. You're our counselor. You're our guide. And so we're so thankful because you're the one. You're the one who leads the course. You lead the dance. You're the epic or ego of the spirit. You're the one who supplies the spirit. And so we're asking you right now, minister to these people. Yes, meet them at that place. We're asking in faith. And every heart said, well, somebody give the Lord a shout. And listen, to, so you know on the camera, you don't have to prepare a song now. I'm going to do it after, after, the, after we get off broadcast. Yes, we're going to do it for these people here. Anybody love him? Well, listen, let's do this because one of the things that we're trying to emphasize to people, as I was borrowing from the testimony, as a woman of God was sharing, she was communicating about, at first, when she woke up, she began to, she began to uh, evaluate, do an examination of her person. I mean, know that's what we do. We, we evaluate our person. But I told you, man, we was talking about last week. We was trying to teach people how to say, you know, we love to say faith ain't fair. We say that, though, when we, we, we got the blessing, we got the benefit, everything going good, it'll come through. We're doing better than some other people. We said faith ain't fair. I said, we need to learn how to say faith ain't fair when you didn't get the check. When they, when they canceled the loan. When you didn't get the house. When it didn't go through. Stand up there and say, favor ain't fair. Yeah, because that means God don't favor another avenue in which to bless me. 
He hasn't chosen another vehicle, another means. That was it. And listen, because you and I, ain't, we're not reading the tea leaves. We're not reading things from what we see because we know we don't live by what we see. Am I right about it? Because if we can't see the day, we can't do the work anyway. Am I right about it? So we don't assess. It's not our assessment of what we think the situation is that lets us understand what's really going on. And you know your body, I keep telling you, I told you last week, your body is a liar. So if you're going to consult your body for how, you, how things are going, he ain't going to tell you the truth. Because he ain't saved. Your body ain't saved. And I know, that's a, I know that's, a rude, that's a rude awakening right there. Let me do it one more time. I said, your body is not saved. Are you hearing me? So I don't know what kind of instrument, I don't know what kind of understanding you're looking for it to give you. I don't know what assessment it's going to try to give you on your situation. You are consulting someone that does not have an authentic relationship with God. He's a slave. He doesn't know what it means to rule. He doesn't know what it means to be in charge. He doesn't know what, what it means to know the will of God. I'm right about it. You don't know none of that. Right? He ain't saved. Your body is not saved. And your mind, your soul working on it. <laughs> what you say? Your soul working on it. He, he, he can't fully be trusted. Am I right about it? That's what the Bible says according to Hebrews 12 chapter verse, I'm sorry, Romans 12 chapter verse 1. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by what? The mercies of God that you present your what? So you, you think about it every time you think about your body, right? Every time you think about it, that every time that it's trying to tell you, I can't afford it. I'm not feeling this way. No, I ain't going to be able to do that. I ain't going to be able to do this. My body is saying he can't afford it. Yep, but that's what a sacrifice is, isn't it? A sacrifice is giving God what you can't afford. Yeah, yeah. You're giving God what you can't. You say, I can't afford to do this. So you, a sacrifice is when you're going beyond. You can't really do this. You don't have it to do this. It's allocated already. Man, no, you know, I'm, I'm spent. And, you know, I worked on that job, man. I was on that two shifts. I did 16 hours a day. I ain't going to be able to do that. Am I right about it? But we're trying to get an education and we're trying to get an elevation of our comprehension. Our understanding about God is that when you can't afford, he can. And so we're learning how to live by what he's revealing and not what you're assessing. So in these days, moving toward the last days, our mindset's got to shift out. We've got to make this shift. Am I right about it? Because God, remember, God uses stuff that's broke. He's using broke things, low things, things that ain't got no means, things that was left out of the Industrial Revolution. That's what first Corinthians first, second, first chapter told us, right? God said, I'm... I want you to see your calling because if you don't see it, you're going to think you're bringing something to the table. If you don't see it, you're going to really think that, okay, when I feel, I'm, I'm not feeling too good today, but when I feel better, I'd be able to do that when I'm feeling better. Well, who, who said you was feeling bad? This question, question yourself. Why do we accept every time, when, every time the enemy is using an, a, an aspect of our being and we assess, well, you know, I'm not, well, I'm not feeling too good today. Okay, well, who, 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 who consulted? Who you consulted? Who informed you? Who told you you weren't feeling well? You said, oh, my body. Okay. Okay. Now, to not to stand in the way of sinners. <laughs> not to stand in the counsel of the ungodly. You ain't supposed to stand in the counsel of the ungodly. Your body's ungodly. He ain't saved. He ain't redeemed. And you're listening to his counsel. I say, you listen to his counsel. Is your body advising you? Now listen, I'm telling you, we're going to have to listen to God. Now that time God will speak to you, but it needs to be God speaking to you and telling you. And you got to get develop a practice of God talking to you about things that you talk to you about. See, we, take, we, we, got, we have a thought on our bodies, right? We feel like that's the one thing that we got charge over. It's my body. Yeah, right. But I thought you died so you could enter into another body. I thought you died to one body to come into another one. Right? And you got to develop the mentality and the mindset to learn how to live inside the body of Christ. And got to learn how to let this man be in you. Right? This man that was also in Christ. Right? Because remember, you're no longer you, your own anymore. You are Christ's. The Bible says we are Christ. First Corinthians 12, chapter verse 12 says, Ye are Christ. 
We got to learn how to develop that, practice that. See, we got still got a little mixture of saved and unsaved. You know what I'm talking about? That? Yeah, we still got a little unsaved thing going on. We still live from that place when it's convenient. We, want, want, we don't want to do something. We use it. But if you got to do something, you got to do something for you. You override. You, that's, that, at that point, you tell your body, hey, listen, you're a slave. You do what you told. But the other times, he's the master. And you're doing what he's telling you. I said, the other time your body becomes the master, and you're doing what your body tells you. But when you see something need you think needs to be done, you want to do it, you rise up. Body, you're a slave. You ain't got nobody telling me what to do. Right? Am I right about it? But listen, we got to change this. I'm telling you, for where we are in time, if we're going to get to where we need to get to, because if Jesus, all they ever came up before me were thieves and robbers. The spirit that really steals and takes and robs, and I may hold you up at gunpoint. Use force, force you into submission. Force you to bind you into the lie. That religious spirit. That spirit always came up before Jesus, always trying to perpetuate itself like it is. It really got it going on. That, that the scribes and the Pharisees, all these religious groups, and many of us have bought into it. That's why Jesus warned us. And Matthew 24 said, listen, the last thing I'm telling you, he said, listen, take heed that no man deceive you. We're in that time. You don't have to go, Christ over there, Christ here. Where is he? It's the Christ in you. And that's going to be an elevation and understanding and comprehension from God in these days. You know, we're talking about this. Let's go. Let's see if we can go there. Now, it's one God was talking about, and it just kind of quickened my mind. Uh, we were talking about it because we're trying to get people into that. We're trying to get them in living in the God class. Now, we're not trying to be wealthy. We're not trying to be rich. We're trying to be what comes with the package. We're not trying to be wealthy, trying to be rich. Am I right about it? We got a covenant with God. Am I right about it? That covenant demands certain things that we walk in it. Therefore, you don't have to get outside of God trying to use your energy to be something. You're trying to use your energy in these days to find out something. Am I right about it? That's something God done already set up for you, made for you. And he didn't want you, that's why he called you more than. I'm right about it. You're not just a conqueror. You're not just going to battle. You're not just going to fight. We're not coming out here. We're not trying to look, look for a fight from the devil. Am I right about it? We're here to make a stand from the fight that we've already been won. He's trying to make me fight. I'm trying to stand. I'm trying to stand and stand in the victory that's already been wrought. Am I right about it? If I'm more than a conqueror, why am I on the battlefield? Am I right about it? The enemy, done, listen, I'm out on the battlefield. The enemy trying to make where I live a battlefield. Am I right about it? That's why he said don't give him what? Don't give him any what? Why we ain't giving him no play? Because he's coming to you. He's coming to you to try to get you to come out. He wants you to come out from the victory. Come out from what God has already done. Let me get you out here. Take me on. Take me on. Come on down. We better than you. When the Bible says, I'm going to make Job curse you to your face. We better than you. God, we better than you. Let me show you. I'm going to make this boy curse you to your face. Because we better than you. God says, too late. Ain't none like him. Ain't none like him. Are y'all hearing me? Ain't none like him. He done called the end from the beginning. Now, you got to go through the process. I get it because you need darkness to work. Yeah. You need to do everything you can to try to deceive him. Heard him touch, you didn't touch his body, you didn't touch his stuff, you didn't touch his wife, you didn't touch his children. You got to touch everything. You see what it took for him to try to make Job curse him? He went after everything he got because he thought Job was vested. He thought Job had as much skin in his possession as he hid in his worship. He thought he had as much favor, he leaned as much on that stuff as he did on God. But it was in for something. Because ain't nothing like that, boy, I'm telling you. Now, you're going to have to do your thing. You're going to have to do what you do so you can know what I'm telling you. Are you hearing me? So a lot of times people are going through stuff and people want God to kind of preempt that process. They want to preempt that process. But as we think about it, we think about it, the process, quite how valuable your process is. Because your process, what you go through, is talking to you. 
It's informing you. Are you hearing me? It's telling you something about you, and it's revealing something that you can't know apart from the process taking place. Yes. Now, you know if we could get rid of it, we could eliminate what we're going through, you know we'd be out there on the front line. We'd be picketing, recruiting. Yeah, we'd campaigning for folk to help. Right. Yes, we would. Yeah. But God has ways of bringing about processes. Next thing you know, you're just over there. You're in there. Yeah. Let's take a look. Now, if you don't mind, you know, we talked about it last week it was in Psalms 23. What we're trying to do is wake people up. We're trying to get them acclimated to who we are and what God done purpose. You know, sometimes I feel a little bit bad about saying, knowing who we are. Because that's so academic. That is so basic to who we are, to know who we are. When you are something, it just seems so basic to know who you are. Are you hearing me? But as believers, this life is so new, it's so fresh, and it's so infinite. It is so eternal, it's so everlasting, till it's going to take us a while to stretch out a little bit, put lean on a little bit, lean back on a little bit, lay back on it, rest on it. We're going to lean on this thing, and, and you've got to do it on different angles, different places. You know, you've got, you got to check out that thing from east, west, north, south. You've got to lean on it. You've got to lean with it, rock with it. You're going to have to, you have to work on it. This thing is so new. And see, every single morning, it starts all over. You get a brand new set of downs every day. And so if you, if you don't understand it works that way, you, you and I, be, that's why we, people warn us against fighting, fighting permanent, fighting permanent, with a permanent fight, permanent mentality. Over temporary situations. Sometimes we see something. It's, it's temporary. It looks like it's here to stay. And so we'll bring a permanent man over something that's temporary. And you don't know the life that you're from. That's, that's the perspective you've got to have about anything that comes after you. Because in this whole world, everything here, right, is temporary. It's temporary. And it's subject to change. And if you don't keep that in your mindset that you get a new series of down and this new life you got any man being Christ, this thing keeps crescendo. Every time pressure put on it, every time it's challenged, there's a new aspect that it can reveal to you about it that you didn't know before you had to fight. And if we learn how to be able to relate to crises and hardships and difficulties from that place when things are putting pressure on you, to know there's another aspect of God. Because Jesus told you that in John 14. He said, listen, I, listen in my Father's house, and see, you, listen, what you go through helps to introduce the house to you. When you're going through certain things, you're on tour. You're on tour. And we got the porter taking you around. Look at that house. To you to discover things about God in places you didn't think he was in. Ain't no way in the world for you to know God everywhere. You can't know God's everywhere. That's nowhere God's not. But there are going to be places that the enemy uses, pitches a tent right there, create a fight create a scene and try to convince you God don't care? Don't you care that we perish? We out here, don't you see that storm? Don't you see that water? Don't you see them winds? He even done pitched the tent in the wind. Done pitched the tent in the waters. And he's, listen, he's working with that to try to convince them that, well, Papa's house is limited. See, right here, he's one of them heirs right here that he don't care. He done, he done lost a little bit of who he is right here because of this. But he wakes Jesus up, Jesus gets up and says, Oh, ye of little faith. What? They didn't know. They didn't, they, they didn't know how expansive and extensive Papa's house is. They didn't know that Papa had a provision even when the tsunami is beating on your house. Even, it doesn't matter what the level of the crisis is. Jesus, can you imagine getting up from sleep, walks up, don't even look at the storm, look at them. Isn't that something? He gets up from sleep. They raging, but we about to die. Jesus don't even look at the storm. He looking at them. Oh ye, winds are raging. Waters are covering in the coming into the ship. Jesus ain't even look. He looking at them. Oh ye of little faith. Not concerned about it. They not worried about that. That's Papa's house. Let me show you. I'm going to show you what's in Papa's house. Turns from them and said, listen, speaks to the wind. Command the way as he commands. Think about what that does for you in life. Think about you and I for what we are. Listen, let's look at it. What I told you to go yet? You ain't there yet. In the prophets? In the prophets? In the prophets, man? We got it? All right, now. I don't see mine.
Uh, it may not be there over here. Oh, that's it. That's it. Let's do this. Y'all got it? All right, now. First of all, we were in. Uh, thank you. Did I give you a verse yet? Okay. Now, here, here's one thing we're trying to get us as believers that we got we to gotta buy into this. See, right now, when I say that, it sounds basic, academic, the fact that who we are. Somebody telling you about who you are. But I'm going to show you something real quick. If you don't go, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. Over there. I knew y'all know we were coming. I knew y'all know we was coming. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, listen. See, the only way you can know who you are is in the light of who he is. Until he reveals himself at certain dimensions and certain spheres, certain things that he reveals about himself, you can't know it. So when David says in Psalms 23, the Lord is mine. So when you start to put handles and inscriptions on people, then you have an idea what to expect. Right? If David called him, first of all, he said, the Lord. When he said the Lord, he's elevating, he's elevating his work to a different place than the natural, the average one who shepherds or leads sheep. This shepherd here is, is in a whole other classification and category of provision. Because this shepherd here is not just someone who leads sheep, but he is the owner of the land. He owns the real estate. He owns the sheep. There he is. And not only he owns the sheep, but he owns the territory. The land belongs to him. So if you think about it in respect of the Lord's relationship to everything, everywhere you got to go, geographically where you got to go, right? And where you, and where you have to go for provisions, uh, where your resource is going to be. And you gotta, so you, if you think about it in those terms, it puts you in a whole different place. So you think about the Lord being your shepherd. Now, in 1 Corinthians, I, I'm emphasizing this for a point. I'm going to come back and make a point because I want us to begin that we got to look in a different light that us being out here and think about the kind of leadership that we have. I need us to think about the least. We don't just have leadership from people where you're inside of a church. You got, an, you got a pastor. You got, an, you got a, uh, an apostle or a prophet or you got a bishop or someone who's leading you. You got to remember he's hosting. That those leaders are hosting. And they're supposed to be hosting what the Lord really wants to give you and where he really wants to take you. Am I right about it? So that's why you have to evaluate your leadership in terms of what they're communicating to you to make sure that Paul said, follow me as I do what? As I follow the shepherd. So now if you're not following like you need to follow our tracking, you may lose some of your packages along the way. Then we talked about Amazon, we talked about FedEx, and we talked about uh, UPS and how that it, when it comes down, you know, when they, anytime they sign a contract with you for anything you need delivered, that in, any package you need delivered, every one of them give you a contract with a tracking number. And they, at, any, at any given time, they can look at that log and tell you where your package went, who handled it, what time it left, what time it got back, if, they deliver, uh, if it didn't deliver it. I said, people believe in Amazon, they believe in FedEx, they believe in UPS, they believe in all these systems, but then they, do, they are not very convinced of God's system. God the best, got the best packaging system that exists on the planet. He has the best one going, and folk don't know much about it. They don't know that God knows how to keep track with everything. And I had time, I'd take you to those verses, to take you to Acts, the 10th chapter, and I'll show you some things about God's tracking system. I'll show you something that God has, just like, just like UPS, FedEx, right, and Amazon, they got a log that they put all those contracts to keep up with everybody who comes in their store. Those folks, you call on the phone. You call on the phone. Those people can look up, punch in some numbers, and look at when you came in, the store you came in. They can look at the package you got. And God can do the same thing. The Bible calls it the book of remembrance. God has a book of remembrance. The Bible says, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, right? And you shall have them. Matthew 18, 97, any two of you shall agree on earth as touching what? Anything. You going to be able to keep up with all that? Are you going to be able to keep up with all this stuff? Anything you shall ask, it shall be done for them of your Father which is in heaven. Didn't he say it? 
Now, we think about it for a moment. As we, and it's out this time because we're really trying to really get in here to understand how God does what he does and understand the system he got in place to make sure that everything you need from him. You remember he told us in Matthew in the fifth chapter, he said there's not a sparrow that falls from the sky that God don't know it. Birds can't fall. I got I got I got a track. God got tracking on everything. And he showed us showed us one of the, the trackings that he got when he was talking to Elijah when he when the brook dried up. You know the Bible talking about how God was sending the raven and the Bible the raven would come every evening. He was right on time every single evening and bringing meat for Elijah to eat. And think about it. God used one of the most selfish birds that exist in the planet. That's a raven. Selfish. And yet God chose the most selfish bird because he's using that bird to make a point. He's emphasizing that God, I can use the extreme opposite that don't even favor you. And yet I can take one who don't even have a, pro, have a proclivity or a, a inclination to do anything for you. And yet I'm going to use a raven to be here every evening to make sure you eat. I mean, you could use birds that got that has the propensity and the proclivity to, 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 to do things. But a raven, selfish bird, you want to use him and make, yep, and he's going to be there, right there, be there on time every day. Now, isn't it amazing when the brook dried up? The raven knew it's time to go home. Wonder who told the raven to stop bringing meat. The Bible said when the, the brook dried up, the raven stopped coming. Elijah had to get up and leave to go to Zarephath. Wonder who tapped, hey, bro, you don't come no more. How he knew. I'm trying to tell you God's tracking system. I'm trying to tell you how he's in touch and what he's in touch with. All the things that God controls. I've had those experiences myself. I've used it you guys before you i've had the bees i had the ants i've had the, the robin you know uh, uh when i was, was blessed when the time when god had blessed me i was talking about my yard someone was gracious and, and blessed me blessed me with, with a lawnmower and i'm so excited i'm just out there cutting grass and I, I ain't said nothing to god just cutting and god sends a robin comes up robin sitting down the yard i bow i'm going up and down the grass cutting just smiling just smiling and the robin sitting out there in the grass and i'm thinking how you sitting in the grass and ain't moving? I'm cutting. I'm going back across. He's just sitting there. So after a while, I'm going across. I don't finish cutting the yard. I stop. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. I'm trying to figure this what? What's going on? So I had to why I couldn't figure it out. So I left. I went on down side. I'm cutting the rest of the yard. By the time I got through cutting down the side and I come back around, he's still sitting there. And finally it dawned on me. As a song, I think about Joe Lagun that he sings. Joe Lagan sings, if a robin can say thank you, you can do it too. That song hit my mind because I, 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 I like to sing that song. I woke up early one morning, right? And so as I think about it, he said, he's talking about, he's looking at the one that see the robin singing. And at that song, if a robin can say thank you, you can do it too. He had that robin to stand there and wouldn't let him move. Until I stood in that yard and started thanking God for these people blessing me with this normal because I didn't have the money to buy it. And there's other things I was planning on doing. But God, I got blessed me. He said, you ain't even told me thank you. Put that robin out there to remind me to tell him thank you. God got a tracking system. He kept up with the transaction that took place for me to be blessed with it and know what I'm supposed to say at the time I'm supposed to say it. I bless you with it. I know who it, I told him I put on their heart to bless you with it. And now here you are going about your business and you ain't open your mouth and said nothing. He's tracking my attitude, my mindset, my, my position and made sure the robin knew to be out there at that time when I got ready to cut, to cut the yard and make sure the robin was out there standing and stay there until this boy recognized that he needed to give me thanks because he had his mind. He wasn't finna buy no lawnmower, didn't have no money to buy now. Somebody blessed him with a lawnmower and you ain't gonna tell me thank you. Somebody said if a robin can say thank you, you can do it too. So I'm telling you, his track and sin, what God can do and what he's capable of doing and what he's doing to his people in this hour and this hour. Listen, we got to come on in, man. There's an understanding, a comprehension of what things that God is doing, things that God is making available unto us. There are things that we got to understand about. I'm talking about who we are. Because remember, our role in the planet, we have spent so much time pulling on heaven, pulling on God to get God to do things. And the things that we've been put here to do, we have no focus on them. We spend a lot of time praying stuff in that we need, that we think we want, 
as need to be, and we've lost sight on the reason we in the planet. Now, let's do it. First Corinthians, first chapter. You there? Now, if you don't mind, in this first chapter, somebody got the text? Real quick, what that, what that 21st verse said? Because remember I told you this is call day, right? Y'all know what time it is. There's a summons, there's an invitation. God's calling his people. And I'm trying to speak to folk that's sitting at home, that's sitting at home that should be in church. And then you, listen, then, then got acclimated to virtual, virtual church, and you done gave up being in the physical building. And I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest mistakes you can make. Because you know what happened these three years that we've been out. A lot of us have got acclimated to this place, and we done decided, we done made a determination of how we're going to do church. But I want to take you back to Matthew 16, when Jesus said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And remember, remember, Jesus didn't put no affirmation when they revealed everything that they said about him. He put no affirmation on what folks in the street had to say. People were making decisions about what Jesus has said for himself. That he's the only one that should be making his decisions. We got folks determining how they're going to do church. They're determining how they're going to relate to God. They're determining what sacrifices they're going to make and not going to make. It ain't that kind of party. As some of you and I got to understand in these days, and listen, what we got going on, this drag and all the stuff that we're doing, this lackadaisical stuff, the stuff we're giving God, you got to know he didn't sow that. Come on with me. I said, y'all got to know Jesus didn't sow that. Are you hearing me? I said, you got to know he did not sow it. The Bible tells us he became, according to Hebrews, the fifth chapter, though he were a son, yet he learned or he practiced, used obedience in the things that he suffered. Jesus used every, every suffering, every challenge, every disadvantage, every persecution, everything that came against him, he used it to reveal his relationship. We told you there's a children of disobedience. There are children of obedience. Crisis, hardships, and difficulties don't give us obedience. You don't learn obedience by the things that you're going through. What going through reveal, allow you to know something about who's in you. And he uses what you go through to reveal things that he wants to say to you. Because if your crisis and your hardship was your education, if that was your, that, that's what the intent, we all should be brilliant, geniuses. All of us should be geniuses. <laughs> Am I right about that? That's from what we've gone through, right? You should be a genius. Some people, what they've gone through, the hardship, the difficulty, they, they learn from that. Oh, my God, they should be brilliant. Are you hearing me? But that was not the intent. The Bible said he practiced, he used. The word learning is not, not, your, not your sufferings teaching you who God is. Are you hearing me? God, Christ ain't out there in that. He's in you. What those things do afford you to practice who the Christ is and give him opportunity to come out. It allows him to get out from under that bushel. It allows him to get out from under that bed. Your thing that you go through gives you an opportunity to express your love for him. Reveal who he is in you. Are you hearing me? The Bible said, though he were his son, yet he practiced, used obedience in the things that he suffered. We use suffering things that we suffer not to do something. We say, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't know how I'm feeling. You don't know how, how my mama died. You don't know how my baby just died. You don't know how this happened. And you don't know how that is. You don't know how them people treat me. And we use that to not do anything. Jesus didn't use his suffering to not keep coming. The Bible said while we were yet sinners or while we were still yet in the process of sinning, he didn't stop. He didn't let out his weakness detour him. He didn't back up because he came to his own and his own did what? Receive. And because they didn't receive him, he did, he did not, not stop coming. We use what we go through, things that happen, we use that as an excuse not to do. Are you hearing me? And that's not who you are. That's not who he was. And he sold that attitude, that mindset, that mentality. Though he was reviled, he reviled not again. The Bible said he went, didn't speak a mumbling word. He accepted his lot. Yes. 
He accepted Papa's intent. He accepted his purpose because that was the reason for which he came to the planet. Are you hearing it? One of the main problems with us, we don't know why we're here. And we don't know that what you go through, your hardships, your difficulties, is introducing your calling to you. Now how are you going to know it? Your calling got to be perceived. Are you hearing me? It's got to be understood. You got to behold it. You gonna, how are you going to observe it? By the, by the things that you go through, it's introducing you to your calling. It's not telling you not to come forth. It's not telling you you can't obey God. Well, you don't know how many people, you don't know how I was rejected when I was a child. You don't know how my father never, never reached out to me. He never mentored me. He never gave me this. You don't know how my mother, listen, I was a black, black sheep of the family. You know, my, my smick sister, my other sister, they didn't want to always got the attention. They didn't want to always got the thing. They always, they didn't want that they took him. They always said, baby, those things are talking to you and telling you something. It's not for you to charge them. It's not for you to challenge them. It's not for you to disqualify them. It's not for you to think that you don't have value because they didn't place value on you. If they didn't place value on you because it's another message God Papa trying to give you. When Joseph came through that, all 11 brothers, all 11 brothers rejected him. And then not only that, mom and dad rejected him. How do you survive? How do you survive when all your loving and your brothers reject you and then your mom and your daddy, they also turn against you because of what God purposing for you. God got something for your mom and daddy don't see it. So they're op- they on the opposite end of the spectrum. The brothers can't see it because they think you're making yourself better than them. You can't see it and you're trying to make them feel you're better than them. Hello? I said, you don't see it either. Yeah, you boast them, and God using your boast to make them mad enough to want to kill you. What you say? I said, God using the call on you, the anointing on you to make them folks so mad with you. So they hating on you. Well, God using what's on you to make them mad so you'll go where you got to go. Because if you don't get an emotion, ain't going to be no motion. If you don't get mad about it, you ain't going to do nothing about it. I'm right about it. And listen, if it doesn't impact or affect you a certain way, you're not going to get up. So God let stuff get through to you. Get to, oh my God. Oh, how I felt. Oh, what my mama said to me. Just wait till I get 18. You just wait how my daddy did treat me. Man, when I get out of this house, you watch what I'm going to do. What you say? God know how to use that pain, don't he? I said, pain got a voice. I said, pain got a voice. And God knows how to use it. And we're going to come in and know, understanding God, he has a special skill. I know God was special. God is special. He got such a special skill. Boy, he know how to use pain. Don't he know how to use it? He know how to use pain. And you and I are going to give that education on learning how God uses things. And guess what? Favor ain't fair. What you said? I said favor ain't fair. Because even in your low place, even in your hardship, your challenge, your betrayal, your rejection, even in what wasn't given to you, even you didn't get the nurse, even if you didn't gain the favor from your big sister, your big brother, or from the people that you really looked up to, and if they didn't give you what you thought you need, baby, favor ain't fair. Because Job's will come down to the end of his life, and he recognizes something. When them boys showed up, and they realized what had been done, and they wanted to pay obeisance, we are so sorry. Man, we didn't realize this was happening. You meant it for my bad. But God intended for my my good. See, now he's seen his calling. It took him a while to come to that place. How many of us out here, we're still in that place. How many of us out fighting against stuff that folks fight against you, you fighting back. People don't like you, you liking them not, you liking them back, not liking them back. People do certain things against you and you take it on their attitude. You don't understand what those things are about. You don't know what those things are crafting on you. You don't know how those things, that's your transportation. Maybe how folks are treating you, not treating you, affecting you. Maybe that's your ride. That's your ticket. That's your ticket to where God done called you to be. Are you hearing me? I said, that's your ticket. It's your, listen, that's your ride. And as we start to see it, I'm almost done. Let's read the text. But we got to see this. It's called day. And we got to see what we're called to. 
And one of the ways you see it is to recognize by virtue of what you're going through, your challenges, the hardships. Because remember he told you to whom much is given. You got to evaluate. Some of you don't think you got much. But listen, if you don't think it, your trials, your tests going to show you. Hey, baby, if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't wake up, if you don't come to realize it, baby, what you're going through will bring you. It'll get you there. Maybe the statement you say, I'll take you there. Yeah. But listen, baby, your child, your test, if, if, listen, if you miss it on every other end, baby, your, what you go through is, is talking to you. Pain got a voice. Are you hearing me? It's speaking. And it's talking to you about the things that God done purpose and God done mandated for your life. And a lot of us don't see it. We try to try understand, try to figure it out. Can't see why God allowed it when he could have stopped it. Yeah, easily. Easily. Easily he could have stopped it. Easily could have. And people always say, well, God allowed. Well, you know, God could have. He could have. He could have. He could have. That ain't the question. Wrong question. Anyway, God could have. What is he after? Where is he taking me? Where am I going? How much I got? <laughs> How much more this could have come? <laughs> so I can get. <laughs> so I can. So I can get rid of so I can get rid of At some point, you got to wake up and smell the coffee. And recognize this is your life, baby. This ain't going to change no time soon. Which means the relationship you got with God is so much bigger and so much vaster than that. God not concerned about you in that. I said, he's not concerned about you in that. You see what he did when he came up on the ship and these, these men. Some of man, you don't care that we perish. And what? He didn't address that. I address this. O ye of little faith. Care that we, they want him to care about perishing. I didn't bring you out here by perishing. I brought perishing out here to show you the power that God got and the investment he made. You too important. You too valuable to let winds and waves and water take you out. If I expose you to it, if I let you saw it to that degree, then 1 Corinthians 10, 13, got to be true. No temptation taken you, but such is common to man. God is what? Faithful. It will not suffer, not allow you to be attempted above that you are able. But see, the people tell this, God won't put no more on your stuff. Stop it. You won't get it. If that's your man about, well, God ain't going to put no more on you than you can bear. Baby, listen, that ain't, the verse is so far be transcendent than that. It's not about God putting things on you. It's about the things you face trying to open you up to allow the God on you, in you, at that level to address it. You got a deposit on the inside of you that says God is faithful. And that no way in the world for you to know he's faithful unless you encounter those things. God ain't putting no more on me. How are you going to know that these things are here to reveal the level of God's faithfulness to you? You can't know God's faithful unless he get in that place where you need him to be. You got to need him to be. You got to need him to show up. You got to need him in the face of dying, rejection, betrayal, loss, things not happening. You got to need, you need him to be in that place. You need to go there so he can show up. You need him. You need him to let you have to encounter something you think you ain't going to make it through. You need him. You need him to do that. Because if he don't do it, you can't know it. The same way you couldn't know he loved you if he didn't give his son. God had to introduce love to us. None of us had love was our idea. You think we somebody tell me I'm born a lover? No, you weren't. You weren't born no lover. Are you hearing me? The Bible said we love because he first. Now he was the love. He's the born. He listen, he wasn't even born. You can't born love, baby. I said you can't born love is eternal. It don't have a beginning. And it don't have an end. What y'all say? I say it don't have a beginning and it don't have an end. God is love. He don't have it. He is it. And love never began. It always has been. Because it's always been God. So ain't no way to know it because of the world that God lives in. And we told him, we say in the beginning God. Everything that existed previous to a beginning. The only somebody who got that information are people who existed before the beginning began. Are you hearing me? 
And that means God, God, and God, and his, the intricate nature of his being and his existence as God of his, his Godhood, his Godhead, is the only somebody understood, understood love. Because, love, like I said, everything else had a beginning. Angels, demons, Satan, the devil, Lucifer, all were created. They all had a beginning. There's somebody who had some information prior to everybody else who had a beginning. That's the one we're trying to talk to. That's the one we want to know. The one who got information before things start. What y'all say? Can I say it again? The one who got information before anything starts. Papa got information. And before anything break out, he got information. He lives in that world. And we just don't want to be without him. I'm going to live with him in this world. Right? What y'all say? I'm almost done. Let's do it. What's the first question? I'm saying something to us because I need us to move, to move from this, this same old, same old trekking around the same, around the same water hole and elevate to another place of understanding on this Christ that lives on the inside and what he wants to give to you and I to operate from a whole other place so we can understand that we're called to these people. Many of us think we're so afraid to talk to people. We're afraid to witness and share that we're going to be rejected, that they ain't going to want it. Baby, you got to get a deeper understanding. You think Jesus was concerned about, listen, the Bible said he came to his own, right? And they didn't receive him. You think he didn't know it, but he still had to go? When you know what you got to do, you got to do what you got to do. It doesn't matter what people receive you, they don't receive you. It would be wonderful if they did. But then if they don't not receive you, because God got a higher purpose. You remember we told you that out of Ezekiel, the second chapter. When God sent Ezekiel to the house, and he says, I'm sending you to a rebellious house. And he said, but they're not going to change. He said, if I send you down there, they ain't going to change the thing. They're going to be rebellious. They're going to be rebellious when you go, come, and they're going to be rebellious when you leave. Well, what are you sending me for then? Because the, the point is not I'm sending you for them to receive you. I'm using your going to drop seed. What y'all say? Because one man got a plant. Need somebody that's water. Give God the opportunity to increase so if you understand the process, you know how things work. You're not trying to be the, you ain't got to be the seed and the water, cedar in the water. You ain't got to be the soil and the water. And you definitely can't be the, the increaser. Am I right about it? So ain't nothing you can do with that. So that's in God's hand. And if y'all understand that my part, just play my part and let the others play their part, and God got the back. God got the end game. Am I right about it? God know how to make this thing grow. So we're not going to be worried about that part. You can't be afraid. The issue is they are never going to get to do nothing if they don't get the seed. If there ain't no seed sown, they, ain't gonna, they have no opportunity to do nothing. You got to get some seed in that ground. And you and I got to see people different than what we've been seeing them. These people were born into the planet to serve God. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they think about it. I don't care what they want to or not. Don't matter to me. Ain't none of my business. What is my business though? What am I supposed to do? Am I responsible for seed? Am I responsible to share with them and leave it between them and God? What are they going to do with it? And God knows how to set the water up, but if, but if I don't get the seed in the ground. So you and I, in terms of how we look at people, we look at people, they so intimidate us. I, I, I don't know. Because we don't like, well, and I'm trying to figure out how in the world can a dark-skinned, obscure people be afraid of rejection? You know, over 400 years of it. Being low man on the totem pole. Discriminated against. Segregated. Segregation. Discrimination. Racism. Right? Rejected. On the bottom. The low. Not the one preferred. Am I right about it? We should be good at it by now. Am I right about it? We should be good. We're good at folks. We not take folks telling me no. I don't mean that. It didn't mean anything. 400 years of slavery meant nothing. Today, history is being made. Today, history is being made. Two dark-skinned, obscure quarterbacks going to be facing off in the Super Bowl today. Because it didn't mean a thing. In terms of stopping them for where they got to go. In terms of them rising up. And you saw what happened in the White House. I use it as an example. This dark-skinned, this obscure woman, vice president of the United States, and then got the opportunity to be the president of the United States of America. Didn't stop a thing. It didn't stop it. I'm telling you something. We're in a season and a time now. We cannot allow people to influence you and be afraid and fearful and be lazy about sharing who Christ is to people. 
They deserve to know. Even if they don't want to be saved. Jesus didn't just die for people to be saved. He died for them to have the right for the choice. He died for the opportunity. And if we don't share, they ain't get the opportunity. Because you see, listen, you can, whosoever will, let me, you can or you cannot. You can love him or not love him. You can serve him or not serve him. It's your choice. But if we people don't give people the choice right now, everybody that's a sinner don't have a choice. Let me say it again. Everybody that's a sinner doesn't have a choice. And I've told you before, you can't just walk out of sin. People got to be delivered. They got to be brought out. You can't walk out of darkness. You can't just leave. It's in the nature. And so without the message, without somebody communicating, somebody sharing, somebody telling it, they can't come out. You got to at least plant the seed. Am I right about it? And you can't be afraid of people that God done intended to be a part of his family. Am I right about it? Well, I'm going to get there one of these days. I'm almost done. What? Oh, okay. Ooh, what that is? Ooh. Right quick. Are we there? Got it? First Corinthians? First chapter. We there? Real quick. Now, I'll tell you it's important because I need us to understand. Notice what he says. Because there's a mindset, and every one of us got to evaluate the mindset we got about what we want God to do. How we want God to do us. How we want to live for God. We got our own mindsets. And many times those processes we go through, God uses them to expose that attitude, that mindset. That in reality, we are dictating to God what should be done. We've got to shift out and major on the end of being able to be submitted to God, yielded to God. And like I was saying earlier, because most of us, we're going to consult our bodies, we're going to consult our minds about how we feel or what we're going to do. Not consult him. Because you're in the body of Christ now. And he told you to let this man not be, let your mind be in you, but let his mind be in you. Didn't he tell us to do that? How are we going to do that? I'm going to show you in just a moment. I'll do this real quick. Now, notice what he said. In what, what verse we at? We at 21st verse? Never read a verse yet. Real quick. All right, let me, let, let me get us down to a place and I'll let y'all read. Just, just for the sake of time. The Bible said, for after that in the wisdom what? The world by wisdom, what? They knew not God. And one thing we said, because we said wisdom is knowledge being applied, right? It's the right use, the right application of knowledge. And if the world uses their knowledge in their application, the Bible said it, it, it blocks you from knowing God. When you're using your mind to make a decision about how you need to live, you are blocking the knowledge of God. So he says this in, 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 in the 22nd verse. He says what? For the Jews require a sign, right? And the Greeks, they seek out the wisdom. Everybody got their own way that they're looking for God to manifest himself. Whether you be Jewish or non-Jew, everybody got their own means of looking for God. And notice what he says. He said, but, 23rd verse says, but we preach who? Christ what? He's crucified. And what? Under Jews, he's a what? He's a stumbling block because they can't receive in the way that he came because they're looking for him in a certain way. And every one of us got a certain way we look for God to come when we want to do something. Or when he's after something, we, we want to try to convert the way he wants to do it around the way that's more convenient for us. And we try to kind of manipulate things. And we try to try to wrap things around our mind. We want them to work the way that we think is convenient, easier, better for us to do it. And you got to watch that. You got to watch that in these days. Because the day that we're living in now, as the Lord was going to tell me, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And so God said, he said, this is my day. In the days of Noah, it was a certain way. But like it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be a certain way in the coming of the Son of Man. And in, in his coming, it's going to be similar. Now, here's the reason we got to educate ourselves on that. Because we wasn't living in Noah's day. We don't know the pressure. We don't know how crazy when God said he looked on the hearts of men. When you and I look at and see some of the vile things that people are doing, we think about a man just stabbed his wife, stabbed his wife 14 times and left the knife in her neck. I mean, we think about some of the crazy stuff that people are doing. You think about people being influenced, how they've been affected, how they've been impacted. You and I got to think about where we are with all the things that are going on to get a clue about where we are. Because we can't see the day, you can't do the work. 
And remember, as believers, John 9, I must work the works of him that sent me when? While it's that. You and I got to be able to see the day to do the work. Because otherwise, things that are happening will push, will flail us off, push us back. Certain areas, certain places we're not going to go. Certain things we're not going to do because it's too bad. Man, what, what light for? That's darkness. The bad is darkness. What light for? You, you can both have an influence and effect and an impact on the bad. But it has happened so much, and we think in our mind, it's so bad. That even I don't need to go over there. I don't need to be in that area. I don't need to be living over here. But we got too many people, too many saints that done pray, pray certain things about their neighborhood. Too many Columbia. You had one particular prison place over there. Them guys prayed so they interceded in such a way they impacted the community so, so bad. Till the jail became a Bible study. They had no prisoners. Nobody go to jail. So they turn it into a Bible study. The jailhouse is a study for people to come read the Bible because they got no prisoners. So you need no police. Because they had prayed all the, they gotten rid of all the negativity and all the bad in that area. And so they, the jail was shut down. They started using it for Bible study. What y'all say? We got to get it back. Somewhere in our mindset, we've given up the ground and we don't know we have. We've given up what we're saying to Christ in us. Jesus came to the planet and changed the world. And we're just trying to influence those people that God wants to be influenced. We're not trying to make people be something. But we are making sure they got an opportunity to be something. We're going to make sure you got the opportunity and leave it up to God because we can't make you grow. We can't make you become. It's not my job to make you become. It's my job to make sure you get that seed. It's my job to make sure you can hear it. How can they hear without a preacher? I got to make sure you listen. You can hear it. And you, it's up to you to do it. But listen, we done stopped all that. We, we used to pass by people getting opportunity. Hey, listen, you got a minute? Yeah, what's that? I want to ask, I want to talk to you about the plan. The plan? What, insurance plan? Oh, it's better than that. This is better than the insurance plan. Can I talk to you? You just got a few minutes? Man, I'd be, I'd be all over the place. I'd be everywhere. I was seeking opportunity. I'm, Study places where people that lost be. I go down to the unemployment. I know down there they, they feeling pretty bad. Folk ain't working feeling pretty bad. You got to find people who, listen, in bad enough shape, they're they, they going to listen. You, you got something some bad than what I got going on? Yes, sir. You looking for a job? I know where they are. I know where they are. Tell them. Hey, listen. What you looking for a job? They the, they obviously, they're in the employ, unemployment line, right? But I said, y'all looking for a job? I didn't take that for granted. I said, are you looking for a job? They said, yes, sir. I said, well, I know where they're hiring. I said, man, I'm listening. I know a place, man, they always hiring. Signs always up. Looking for followers every day. Looking for people, to, looking for workers every day. And so I said, come on, you, you got a minute? We talk. You know I'm headed to it. Field is white. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he may do what? Man, over here where I'm at, they praying for workers. You can't hardly find them. You got to pray them in. I know where they're hiring. What y'all say? Man, I mean, I was in on it, on it, all over the place. I'm telling you, all over the place. We'd be some everywhere in the neighborhood. I remember one time it was over in the neighborhood, not far from where I live. And I told Pastor Henry because one of the guys wanted to ride. I took him to his job to get him a ride to his job. But after I took him and got his ride from the job, we'd come back. I said, Henry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call no name, sure. <laughs> I said, I said, brother. I said, now you stay out here. You stay out here. Don't you go in that house. You stay out here until I come back. I go take the guy because I'm sharing with him. Me and him talking on the way to his work. I'm talking to him about the Lord and, and what he needs to do. And we, we, I'm in on it. So after I drop him off, I go back to the house. I can't find him. Where brother at? Where he, he go? I know. So I go knock on the door. And there he is in the house. Oh, I said, oh my God. Man, didn't I tell you not to come over here, man? I said, but didn't I tell you to wait till I came back? Because they got all kind of drugs on that table. They got kilos of marijuana. They got liquor all over the table. I said, come here, man. I said, if the police showed up here, 
you've been going, you're going to jail. I can see it now. You're telling them, well, you know, I was here witnessing. I was here sharing with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yep. We can see that. <laughs> we can see that, that you was over here witnessing sham with all this drug and alcohol everywhere. I said, man, you were going to jail, brother. I told you to stay out here till I came back. I said, okay. I said, listen, here, here we go. Do y'all want to hear the word? Y'all want to hear it? Are y'all interested? Number one. Are y'all interested? Yeah, 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 preacher. We want to hear it. I said, well, put all that stuff up because I ain't going to jail for you. Put all up. Put up. Put up. We're going to talk. Put all that stuff up because I'm not going. I ain't going to jail for you. I'm telling you now. <laughs> so I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, you and I, listen, those, those used to be journeys. Man, you know what the church is missing? You know what's missing from our repertoires, our profiles? We don't have these, we don't have these encounters anymore. We ain't got stuff we can talk about to motivate and smile people. Man, when I used to be in these neighborhoods talking to folks, sharing and the things that God did, and what he had to do to make sure I'm good, we ain't got these experiences because we're not sharing. We're not getting out here and talking. You know how wonderful it is to see people come to the Lord? To watch people break down. I never forget, was at my brother-in-law's house over there in Avondale. We're standing on the front porch. Here's a guy coming from the grocery store. He got his, he got his bag of groceries. Man, he got his bag of groceries, and he walking, he coming. I'm going to have this teacher here, so y'all may have to use it later on. <laughs> he coming from the grocery store, he walking around the corner. We standing on the porch. Me and my brother, and I think my brother-in-law standing there. And so the guy walking around the corner, and my brother spots him. Say, hey, you, right there, with that bag in your hand. God said that you've been going through, things have been happening in your life. Said your mama did this when you was five years old. This happened to you and this happened to you. And said God said to you that he loves you and he knows that what you've been through and the things. I mean, he went down the list. And brother, that brother standing there and he dropped that bag. He dropped that bag of groceries on the ground. And he got down and began to weep before God in the street. Baby, I'm, I'm seeing too much where people in touch with God really, listen, submitted, yielded to God. They can share a word, communicate. But we all locked up in here. Are we locked up on somebody's job and not sharing, not releasing what God said, not exposing the people, not revealing? The Bible said when one who come into your room unlearned, come in without a gift like you possess, he said, you're supposed to be able to prophesy to him, minister to him. He said, I wish that you all prophesy to him. I wish more than you prophesy to him and speak with tongues. I wish that you could prophesy and reveal the secrets of his heart. You could expose his skeletal makeup. Reveal to him what's in his life, what God's in deposit for him to do for his future. Unlock it through the prophetic word. Speak to him. And show him what God got for him. That boy dropped that bag of groceries on the ground. And began to weep for God and stand in the street on Avondale. Right over there in Avondale. Right not far from the Fifth Avenue, the airport highway. We over, over there's a house on the corner where my brother-in-law used to live. Man, he dropped them groceries and began to weep before God right there on the spot. You mean to tell me that that level of gifting, that level of discernment, that level of seeing, that word of knowledge, word of wisdom, word of, word of prophecy, if we weren't out here operating and functioning, we could be ministering to people. You tell me we can't get people in the kingdom. You tell me people won't recognize that when you can reveal to them the things that God that laid on their skeletal makeup and you can unlock their scrolls and you can begin to reveal what's been written in their scroll, in their skeletal makeup, and you can expose that Psalms 139. God... David said, the Lord knows my uprising and my down sittings. He knows my skeletal makeup. That you gotta, you, there's an inscription on every one of our, there's a sc- scroll that's on every one of our life. And the prof- prophetic word unlocks those things. When the prophet speaks and he begins to declare that was God and purpose for your life, and start to unlock that thing and you start to realize all you've been through. And they can, they can begin to put pin, pin together your sufferings with your destiny. And most people can't do that. That's one of the saddest things about people in church and body, the body of Christ and believers is they don't know what their suffering means. They don't know what their challenges mean. They don't know what they're going through, what it's about. Are you hearing me? Somebody God's got to send. Somebody got to prepare them and ready them for what Papa's purpose. And too many of us sitting around and allowing ourselves just to be religious, just growing up like st- stall calves, just becoming fat. In the stall, just just. Growing up in a stall, not out, doing what we need to do. And I'm telling you, that's why I'm saying it's called that. And God summons these people to get back on it. And folks sitting at home, and now they're doing virtual church. 
And they're not even getting out here to inspire, encourage each other with the things that God's doing. We need to be here what God's doing. We need to hear what God's doing with you. We need to hear what you're sharing, what God, how you use you to impact this one and to change that and how you impacted the city. We need you changing things. And it ain't going to happen without you being where you're supposed to be. I've been to neighborhoods. I never will forget I was in my bed. This is the last thing and I'm closing. I never will forget I was in North Birmingham in my bed on a Saturday morning. I was asleep, laid out. All of a sudden, I'm asleep, and I hear music playing. I mean, music coming through my windows. Sound like me. When I used to be playing, playing music everywhere, thinking everybody wanted to hear my music. Man, I heard that music. I jumped up out of the bed, ran over to we, And this how we had that little roll out one. I rolled the window out and looked out. I, don't see no, I went around the front door, went, walked out. Ain't nobody out here. I stood outside and said, ain't nobody out here. He said, that's it. Some supposed to be out here. It's too quiet. He woke me up with music and none was playing. I went outside to see where it was coming from. He said, supposed to be out there. That's when I set up and start going from neighborhood to neighborhood doing street meetings. We set up sound and going to those communities. Man, we watch and listen, have people coming out, folks coming from everywhere. I would be amazed if folks could sit up in a liquor house drinking liquor and hear God from way up a block away and sitting there trying to drink a drink and can't, can't do it, set it down and then come up to the meeting. Say, hey, man, I need one of these in my yard. That's what? He said, yeah, I need one of these in my yard. Said, okay. We prayed for him. But he said, man, I was trying to drink and couldn't. Got the glass up and had to put it back down. So I came out here to come up here. I'm going to need one of these in my yard. Man, I've seen some stuff. I can tell you some stories about the power of God in these streets. But if you ain't there, if you don't have a mind about it, if you're not talking to people, it's not happening. It's cold day. Are we coming? Are we going to answer? Father, right now, while these heads are bowed, these eyes are closed, I'm believing right now, for some of you right now listening to us right now, I believe that God's knocking on the door of your world to change your life. I believe this is a new day, it's a new hour, it's a new season, and I believe that for you that's sitting there listening to me, you felt that knock. I believe you felt the knock at the door. I believe you feel this invitation. You feel this call from God. I believe you feel God summoning you to really, if you never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life, he summoned you right now to accept the reason you were brought to the planet. And every one of us, the Bible says, God said in the book of Bereshit, in the book of beginning, 26 verse, said, let us make man. So we are God's idea. We God's plan. We're not our own plan. We're not our own idea. God decided that he needed people. God decided he needed a man. We didn't decide. So I just want to say to you right now, as we're agreeing together in this place, if you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come to your life, I want to give you an opportunity to get back. As Dorothy said, ain't no place like home. I want to get you an opportunity to get back to where you're supposed to be and get in God. And those of you that maybe you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, maybe you've accepted him and you're not walking where you need to walk and you know you've left him, you're not as passionate, you're not as hungry, you're not as thirsty as you used to be for God. You're not, your heart doesn't pant for him as it used to once did. David says, the heart pants after the water brooks. So do I long for thee, O God. That's as a deer after, after someone's been chasing him, he's looking for the water brooks. Baby, when you understand what goes on in life and you've been in that chase, you know you start to long for God when you've been through. That's a really cry. That's a real appeal to the heavens. And if you're out there, while these heads are bowed and the eyes are closed, I want to ask you to repeat after me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. I'm asking you now because I believe your word. I believe with all my heart that Jesus died, was buried, and I believe on the third day that God the Father raised him from the dead. I believe he died for my sins. And I believe it with all of my heart. And so I'm asking you now, you to come into my heart. I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I ask it in faith, according to your word, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And every heart said, and listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, and even for those of you, maybe you've already confessed the Lord Jesus, but you're not walking where you need to walk. You're not doing the things that you know that that walk is supposed to indict is supposed to inspire in you to do. You're not out there sharing your faith. You're not witnessing. You pass by people all day long. But you think that they're too sedated, they're too upper class for you to say anything with them. Baby, Bible says, if you're going to win a soul, 
You got to be wise. And maybe God, the Bible said God's foolishness is wiser than men. God can show you how to elevate among, even if you think people are wise and smart and got nobility and might and all that. Remember, I didn't get a chance to get to the verse. But 26 verse says, now you see your calling brethren. Baby, you ain't got to be mighty. You ain't got to be a genius. You don't have to be Isaac Newton to win folks with wisdom. Matter of fact, God said, I'm using the foolish things of this world. You got to see that. You got to see that people may not think very much of you, but you got just what it takes to be able to bring them, to, to shame them, to bring them, expose them to realize they need the Lord. So you don't have to be all that. You just need to be available. If somebody said a long time ago, go. The greatest ability is availability because ability don't work if you ain't available. So your greatest ability is availability. If you can be available to the Lord, he can do some mighty things through you. So I just want to say to you right there, on that screen, we have the address. And listen, we need to assist you, help you uh, in, your, in your moving forward. If you prayed that prayer with us, I want, I want you to know the Lord is looking. This is a special time. He's summonsing his people. And so as I'm inviting all of you and asking you, all of you to come and believe in God and asking you. Now, listen, if the broadcast has been a blessing to you, I want on that screen is screen is give the You can go there on the app. It'll direct you on how you can give. Also on that screen is our cash app address. It's dollar sign C-O-G-G. That's W-C-I. And the other one is dollar sign C-O-G-G W-C-I two. And also the address. That's C-O-G-G. That's 600 Tuscaloosa Avenue Southwest. That's Birmingham, Alabama, 35211. One more time. That's C-O-G-G. That's 600 Tuscaloosa Avenue Southwest. That's Birmingham, Alabama, 35211. Listen, you can always mail it or you can bring it by. But I know God will bless your sacrifice and your seed. Amen. Well, listen, we thank God for you. Thank you for tuning in. We know you had a choice, and we just thank God you chose to spend the day with us. As always, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now thanks be unto God, who always calls us to triumph in Christ Jesus, and you have got to be encouraged today.